Good evening. Thanks for coming. It's my purpose tonight to convince you that God exists. Now that may sound foolhardy to you, but the general sort of argument I'm making has a long history going back to ancient times, and countless thoughtful and informed people have found it persuasive. Perhaps you will too, or perhaps my presentation will simply get you to take belief in God seriously. I'm well aware that many people badly want God to exist, and others are just as emotionally committed to atheism, but I'm going to ask you to set your strong emotions off to one side and think with me about explaining the existence of things. Perhaps you have an object in your pocket right now, like this. Suppose we ask, why does this exist? In principle, there are only so many ways we can answer. The least plausible of these is that it simply has to be. In other words, it exists because its non-existence is impossible. But my HTC One smartphone isn't like that. It could easily be annihilated. Just duct tape it to an atomic bomb, set off the bomb, and adios phone. So if we ask why it exists, we can't say because it has to exist, it can't not exist. That's just wrong. Another possible answer is that this phone has just always existed. It's always been around. It did never come into existence. It always was. Because it never came into existence, we don't have to think that anything caused it to exist. But our evidence demands that we reject this answer. We have strong reasons to believe that no such thing existed in the year 1990 much less the year 4000 BC. But perhaps we can jettison the bizarre claim that it's always existed, and yet retain the claim that there's no cause for its existence. Poof, one day it just appeared in my pocket. Okay, but now we've gone from dumb to dumber. <laughs> you wouldn't believe me if I told you that a pebble or a tiny clod of dirt suddenly appeared in my pocket, out of nothing, with no cause, and so without any sort of explanation, you will only laugh if I tell you that a bowl of petunias or a very surprised sperm whale or a smartphone suddenly popped into existence without any cause. We've been wondering if the phone simply has no cause, but that can't be right. It seems that anything which comes into existence must be caused to come into existence. Nothing comes from nothing. Plus, look at how finely its parts are arranged. It's a beautiful and ingenious design, seemingly a work of art. It has some marks on the front, which are letters in a language. It's almost like a signature on a painting. We think they were put there to tell us who made the phone. And on the back, in teeny tiny letters, it says, Made in Taiwan. Now, I've never been there, but I hear that it's a real place, unlike Narnia, Middle Earth, or the planet Alderaan. What if we say that the phone was caused by some unguided event or events? Some process that doesn't involve the actions of any intelligent beings. Maybe it resulted from a phone generating field, or from some sort of evaporation or photosynthesis. Well, wait a second. Obviously, not just any sort of process will do. It's got to be the right sort of process that could produce that. But it's hard to imagine how this can be anything other than an intelligently guided process. Imagine that we travel to Taiwan and visit the HTC factory. We see a big machine which has a conveyor belt going into it, carrying copper, plastic, aluminum, iron and glass. And one conveyor belt's coming out of the big machine, sporting a row of newly assembled phones that look just like that. This plausibly is the sort of process that might result in a smartphone. But who would believe that no intelligent being was involved in setting it up? Even if no human hand touched this phone while it was being assembled, still it would be an amazing feat of engineering to build a machine that could produce this. So we're driven to the conclusion that this smartphone was brought into existence directly or indirectly by one or more intelligent beings and seemingly for certain specific purposes. We're supposed to look at and touch the screen, we're supposed to listen to the speakers, we're supposed to speak into the little pinhole microphone. It's a beautiful, finely crafted device. It's a testimony to the engineering and artistic prowess of Taiwanese designers. So now let's ask about something vastly bigger and more complicated. Why does the cosmos, the totality of physical things, exist? Seems that we have the same options as before. Shall we say that it simply has to be? If there is any contradiction in the scenario that there is no cosmos, no one has any idea what that contradiction is. 
This is why it seems possible that there should have been no cosmos. We can't say then that the cosmos simply has to be. What if we instead say that the cosmos has just always been around, that it's existed for an infinitely long time? Many ancient philosophers thought exactly that, as they found it difficult to suppose that time ever began. If we say that the cosmos has just always been around, maybe we can avoid thinking that something else caused it to exist. But in the 20th century, this explanation was exploded by new evidence. Astronomers analyzed the color of the light coming from distant galaxies and concluded that the cosmos is expanding in all directions. Reasoning backwards from what we now observe, they concluded that a finite time ago there was not a universe like we see today, but only an infinitely dense singularity. They think that space and time trace back to this and no further. Cosmologists think they know to some extent how the early moments of the cosmos career were like, but then what caused there to be a Big Bang? What explains a process so stupendous that it eventually led to all that you see around you? Shall we go with poof? Shall we say that a finite time ago the cosmos just popped into existence uncaused? Why is this more plausible than saying that a pebble or a little clot of dirt popped into my pocket one minute ago? It doesn't seem more plausible at all, it seems rather less plausible. This cosmos is an amazing, super complicated, sublime thing, the secrets of which our best minds are only starting to reveal. It's bigger than a whale, far more intricate than even a smartphone. We find it dumber than dumb to suggest that such things popped into existence a few minutes ago, things like a whale or a smartphone, isn't at least as dumb to suggest that the whole cosmos popped into existence for no reason without any cause some 14 billion years ago. To avoid the dumbest suggestion yet, a few will resort to our dumbest theory. Why not say that the cosmos caused itself to exist? How about that? Well, we can't say that because it's obviously impossible that anything should cause itself to exist. Think about it for a minute. It first has to not exist, and then while it doesn't exist, it has to exercise a power. Things that don't exist don't have powers. That's just nonsense. It'd have to have a power to cause itself to exist, and it'd also not have to have any powers because it's non-existent. So it has powers and it doesn't. Okay, well, that's, that's just unbelievable. We have to think that if the cosmos came into existence, something else caused it to come into existence. What sort of thing might this cause be? It'd have to be some non-physical thing because the cosmos is the totality of physical things. It couldn't be just some process operating according to the laws of nature. As far as we know, those only apply to the cosmos. It looks like it must be a being, not a mere process. And one would think it would have to be very powerful and very knowledgeable to pull off such a stupendous feat as creating the cosmos. Red alert. Sounds like God. This is precisely why a famous physicist coined the derisive term Big Bang for this process. He was mocking it as something unbelievable, ridiculous, religious. He didn't want science to toss up a volleyball for the theist to spike. But physicists and cosmologists have been tossing up many such volleyballs in recent years. They do this by asking how the cosmos would be if various factors were changed by unimaginably tiny amounts. These include the basic physical constants, such as the force of gravity, the fundamental laws of nature, and the initial conditions with which the history of the cosmos began. Being a philosopher, I'm not the person to explain all of these to you, but innumerable scientists can. There's a vast literature on what is called the apparent fine-tuning of the cosmos for the emergence of conscious embodied life. Each one of these basic factors seems contingent. It seems that it could be much different than it is, and as best we can tell, these factors are independent of one another. And scientists calculate that if any one of these delicately balanced factors were changed by even an unimaginably small amount, the cosmos would not be complex enough, stable enough, or orderly enough for any imaginable sort of conscious embodied life to exist. More than two dozen such factors have been discussed in the literature. It seems that out of all the possible ways the cosmos could have been, only a ridiculously small portion of those ways would allow the evolution of beings like you and me. Here are two analogies that philosophers have used to explain this sort of reasoning. Imagine that ISIS captures you, 
and they decide they're going to execute you. You see the commander randomly grab passing soldiers to form an ad hoc firing squad. Ready, aim, fire. But all you hear is 10 clicks. Why are you still here? Is it possible that each soldier getting his ammo from different sources just happened to have a dud bullet in the chamber of his weapon at that moment? It's possible, yes, but ridiculously unlikely. It's overwhelmingly likely that someone meant for you to live. Maybe they're just screwing around with you. Maybe they're trying to torture you, or maybe the commander's secretly on your side. Again, imagine that you have an old school radio with not one, but 10 independent tuning dials, each one with 360 possible positions. This radio can only pick up one radio station, and to do that, each one of the 10 dials must be in a certain position, and that position is different for each of the 10. Let's say that you order one of these guys off eBay, and you know how it works, and as soon as you get it, you plug it in, you turn it on, and it's tuned in. It's getting that one radio station. Now, could it be that in transit, the post office just accidentally jumbled the dials around, and they just happened to come out in the one position where the radio would get a signal? It's possible, but it's wildly unlikely. Its probability is 360 to the tenth. That's the chance that they're going to randomly come out so the station's tuned in. You'd be forced to conclude that someone had intentionally tuned it into the station, though it's possible, barely possible, that the ten dials just happened to get into the right position. Back to the cosmos, we're forced to conclude that some one or more beings who would exist even if the cosmos did not exist, intentionally tweaked the laws of nature, the initial conditions, and the fundamental constants of physics in order to make possible the emergence of conscious, embodied life. And they must have had astounding supernatural power and astounding knowledge being able to predict the consequences billions of years ahead. It follows that Carl Sagan was mistaken when he famously asserted that the cosmos is all there is or was or will ever be. But why think that the cause of the cosmos is God? We've already noticed the cause, of the co the cause or causes of the cosmos must exist independently of it, must be capable of intentional action, and must be incredibly powerful and knowledgeable. That sounds like a God, doesn't it? What else might it be? But is there anything like God's signature on the cosmos? Anything remotely like the letters HTC or Made in Taiwan on my phone? Arguably, there is. Consider the beauty of the cosmos, the beauty of its parts from the atom to the mountain, from the cell to the galaxy. Consider the elegance and simplicity of the laws of nature and the seemingly miraculous fact that mathematics is so useful in our understanding of how the cosmos operates. Consider, too, that there are fragile little creatures scrambling over the face of a little planet out in the corner of the cosmos who nonetheless have the astounding abilities to tell right from wrong, just from unjust, and rational from irrational, and dumb from non-dumb, and dumb from dumber, and dumber from dumbest. These little creatures sometimes cure diseases, form lifelong friendships, and compose symphonies. They can be stunningly beautiful in mind, body, and moral character. Of all the animals, only they even consider preserving species and environments, and only they can figure out how. All of this speaks to the goodness and staggering artistic prowess of the cause or causes of the cosmos. Did evolution produce this? I think so. But it's astounding that it should. Who set things up that way? Just as our factory alone doesn't explain the existence and features of my phone, so evolutionary process alone processes alone don't explain why the cosmos is such as to allow evolution or why such godlike beings eventually resulted from it. Now why think there's only one intelligent source of the cosmos? The answer is because one is all we need. A basic criterion of theory formation is simplicity. If we have two theories that are otherwise comparable, but the first is much simpler than the second, we strongly prefer the simpler theory. Suppose we unearth an ancient statue like this one. Obviously, this object did not just arise from unguided processes, but how many were involved in its production? We suppose one, 
until there is some specific reason to think that more than one must have been involved. Just so when it comes to the cause of the cosmos. One super good, super smart, super powerful source of the cosmos is enough. We don't need more than one. At this point, I imagine a few of you are dying to interject, who made God then? Now, strictly speaking, this is irrelevant. I've been arguing that we should think that the cosmos has a cause, and the most plausible candidate for that is God. To establish that, I don't need to tell you what the cause of that cause is. If we find a paw print in the dirt, and I reason that it was probably made by a mountain lion, I really have explained why the paw print is there. I don't have to also explain why the mountain lion exists or why he was walking this way recently. Some imagine that the who created God statement is a killer objection to theism, but actually the joke is on the objector. Remember that God is supposed to exist independently of the cosmos. He's, so to speak, already there when the Big Bang happens. So at no time could God come into existence, and God's existence couldn't depend on any physical factor, such as gravity, food, oxygen, temperature, etc. The objector foolishly overlooks that God is supposed to be the sort of being which in principle couldn't have a cause. Demanding to be told what or who caused God is like asking what's north of the North Pole. And notice that it has not been a part of my argument that all complexity must be explained by some designer. Being vast in knowledge, a being like God would have some complexity, but he couldn't have been caused. The sort of God monotheists believe in is supposed to be a unique, uncreated creator of all else who is independent, non-physical, eternal, necessary, and great in power, knowledge, and goodness. Finally, some will ask, why not this guy instead, the flying spaghetti monster? I knew you were thinking this, some of you. If you haven't heard of the flying spaghetti monster, I apologize for this digression. Why not say that this invisible, undetectable being created the universe after a heavy night of drinking? For one thing, it's not even clear that the idea of the flying spaghetti monster is coherent. Are we to think that pasta would exist even without any physical cosmos? Do you know what pasta is? For another thing, we know this is a fictional character, created as a way to mock evolution-denying creationists. Absolutely no one seriously claims to have been touched by his noodly appendage. Things are quite different in the case of God. This is not supposed to be a fictional character, and it's certainly not a fictional character invented by sniggering white college boys. Countless smart and informed people have actually believed in a being like this. Some of these people are among our best and brightest. Great scientists like Isaac Newton or Francis Collins, or great philosophers like John Locke or Alvin Plantinga. And countless people claim to have experienced God in various ways, in prayer, in the observation of nature's glories, in the pages of a book, or even in an audible voice or a burning bush. These people are found in all cultures and in many religions. Some seemingly sane and good people have even claimed that this creator sent them as a messenger to the rest of us. So asking me why not the flying spaghetti monster is like asking me why don't I think that Oompa Loompas made my smartphone. I don't think they're real. And if they were real, I don't think they'd be up to making a smartphone. They seem to only be competent at little song and dance routines. Let's be serious. Now, even if you've never met a Taiwanese person, you probably know someone who has. And you surely know someone who believes that they have experienced God. According to a 2014 survey, 83% of American adults say they're absolutely certain or fairly certain that God exists. Probably most of these, at least occasionally, have some experience which they consider to be an experience of God. This widespread testimony that they've experienced God is independent confirmation of our fine-tuning re fine reasoning. Just as our evidence about the HTC company and the nation of Taiwan confirms our reasoning that this phone was intelligently made, so this admittedly more controversial evidence confirms our reasoning that the cosmos must have had a godlike cause. 
Again, a great many sane, smart, and good people believe in and say they've experienced or even communicated with the creator of the heavens and the earth, with a good, generous, powerful, provident parent of creatures. Now, admittedly, not all such alleged prophets are equally plausible. Admittedly, some people have been in the religion business for personal gain, but I commend to you the search for any genuine messenger. You would think that our maker would take an interest in us and would reach out to us. Thank you. So before I get started, let me just say uh, a little bit of something about Dale. Um, as a colleague, Dale's an incredible intellectual, incredibly bright, incredibly organized. A lot of what, uh, what I think about this issue I've learned through him. He, he wouldn't agree with my conclusions, but a lot of it comes through his brilliant insights, and he's also a good friend. So it's just a real pleasure uh, to be up here with Dale. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to argue for atheism, and I'm going to suggest to you that, that you should be an atheist as well. Okay, so what's my thesis? God does not exist. Straightforward thesis. Uh, what are the concepts that are going to involve here? Okay, by God I mean a perfect being. Now, a related notion is that of a greatest possible being. Okay, a greatest possible being is uh, greater than, than every other being in any world in which he exists, and he exists in all worlds. So the idea is the greatest possible being is going to be the greatest across all possible worlds. Possible world sounds like a fancy term, it really isn't. It's just a way things could have been. So for example, you could have attended uh, Brockport, you could have attended Geneseo, but you attend Fredonia. Those are just ways things could have been or possible worlds. And there's an issue here as whether the perfect being is a greatest possible being. I'm going to suggest that the theist is probably locked into that view. But in any case, for now, I'll just be neutral on it. But what do I mean by greatest? What makes one being um, greater than another? One being is greater than a second if and only if the first has more intrinsic moral value than a second. That is, greatness is to be understood in terms of intrinsic moral value. Some theists will say, well, that's not what I mean by uh, greatness, but then I'm at a loss. I mean, if you're not talking about intrinsic moral value, then what are we talking about? By intrinsic moral value, I'm talking about things that are good in and of themselves. So, for example, if you look at the picture on the left, you know, the mother and the daughter enjoying themselves reading next to each other. You have sort of pleasure, you have virtue, you have friendship. You might think those things are valuable in and of themselves, that's an example of intrinsic moral value. Whereas things like money and cars are not intrinsically moral value, morally valuable. They might lead to other things that are more, uh, intrinsically more valuable, but they themselves are extrinsically or just a means to a valuable end. God is a perfect being. Uh, I th I'm going to suggest that we should understand that perfect being is the greatest possible being. And greatness is to be understood in terms of intrinsic moral value. I'm going to give you two arguments for atheism. The best arguments for God's existence fail, and uh, the problem of evil is a fatal problem. So here is the argument that the best arguments for God's existence fail. If God exists, then the ontological or cosmological argument is sound. That is, I claim the best arguments for God's existence are the ontological argument, and I'll cover that in a second, or the cosmological argument. Dale gave you a version of the cosmological argument. He said, like, but look, uh, where did the cosmos come from? They had to come from some sort of independent or self-explanatory being, and hence um, God exists. So he gave you a cosmological argument. Um, the ontological argument is going to argue that God has to exist in virtue of his being perfect. And I'm going to argue that those are the two best arguments for God's existence, and they both fail. So premise two, P just means premise. It is false that the ontological or cosmological argument is sound. Hence, God does not exist. And the two pictures show perfection, right? God gets a 10 across the board. The idea he exists in terms of um, his perfection. And the other one shows the, the, the story of that the world rests on elephants, which rests on a large tortoise. And the idea is that you need some sort of foundational explanation for where things come from. By analogy, you need a foundation on which the world rests. What I want to claim is that the argument for God's existence lives and dies on the ontological argument. If the theist cannot defend the ontological argument, then he cannot defend God's existence. That is, the arguments for God's existence live or die on the ontological argument. So, don't win on the ontological argument, you don't win. 
cosmological argument, the idea is the cosmos come from somewhere and they come from God's hand. Let's look at the ontological argument. So we're going to look at the bottom one for a technical reason. The bottom argument says that if the greatest possible being is possible, sorry for the terminology, but there's, there's no way, a way of getting, getting around to be a little bit technical. If the greatest possible being, the best being, the being that's better than every other being in every possible world is possible, then he necessarily exists. The idea is that necessary existence is a great making property. Why? Well, you might think that independence is great making. It's good that you exist independent of other beings, that no one gave birth to you, that there weren't random or contingent events that brought you about. You're just independent of everyone around you, and the idea is that is a great making property. Premise two, the greatest possible being is possible. The idea is that the notion of a greatest possible being is not a contradiction. And if it's not a contradiction, then it is possible or it exists in some possible world. From those two, hence the greatest possible being necessarily exists. So the argument, what does premise one rest on in the modal ontological argument? It rests on the notion that independence or necessary existence is a great making property. What about premise two? Premise two rests on the notion that God does not involve any contradiction or inconsistency. So let me actually let's review the argument in a little more depth. So premise one, if the greatest possible being is possible, then he necessarily exists. And this consists of three assumptions. If the greatest possible being is possible, then he exists in a possible world in some scenario. If the GPB exists in a possible world, then he exists in all possible worlds. That's part of what it means to um, have necessary existence. And if something exists in, the, in all possible worlds, then it necessarily exists. Premise two rests on the notion that the greatest possible being does not involve a contradiction. And if something does not involve a contradiction, then it's possible. From those two, it's thought that the greatest possible being necessarily exists. Now note this argument is purely based on abstract reasoning. There's no physicists, no chemists come in here. Just involves concepts. Just involves abstract reasoning. And you're thinking, well, how can you show that a concrete being exists just from abstract reasoning? You're well on your way to being skeptical of this argument. In fact, this argument fails for a whole host of reasons. I'll just go over a few. Premise one, modal independence. Necessary existence is simply not a great making property. Imagine a being that is just like God, perfectly, you know, all knowing, all good, all powerful, but who is not so great in other worlds. Would that make him a less, have less intrinsic moral value? No, he would still be maxed out. He would have as much intrinsic moral value in the actual world as he could have. The fact that he wasn't great in other worlds, or maybe didn't even exist in the other worlds, is really beside the point. It would not reduce his greatness were he to be great in the actual world, perfectly great in the actual world, but not great in other worlds or not exist in other worlds. Also, you might wonder whether the greatest possible being is in fact possible at all. Right? The greatest possible being is not possible because there's an infinite sequence of better beings. Right? Imagine you have a being that has a lot of knowledge, a lot of good thoughts, and a lot of power, but you have another being just like him who has even more good thoughts, or even more caring, or even better motives. Now, you might think, well, perhaps because he's an infinite being, there's, there's a maximum here. Perhaps, but then that might block other arguments we're going to see later on. Also, so long as a contingently great being is possible, Right in some world, let's call it beta, some scenario, the world in which you attend, let's say Brockport, if in that world there is a greatest possible being, right? let's call him Danny Bonaducci, um, and he's the greatest in the beta world, but not in any other world, if that's possible, if that's possible, then it's not true that there's a being who's greater than every other being in every world. And lastly, the ontological argument supports the existence of the devil. Right? You just run the same argument. Existence is the worst, worst making property for evil beings. Hence, the devil necessarily exists, or the worst possible being necessarily exists. But the devil and God are both omnipotent, and you can't have two omnipotent beings. All right, so let me just summarize what, I know this is kind of complex and a little bit hard to see at the speed. Um, the basic idea is, look at that first criticism. Necessary existence is not a great making property. And, in addition, it's at least possible to have a contingently great being. What about the cosmological argument? Basically, the cosmological argument said, well, where did the world come from? You know, where do you atheists think the world came from, if not from God? And there are two parts to the cosmological argument. And you saw this very nicely laid out um, in Dale's argument. 
right? Dell always does a great job presenting, kind of like colorful examples, clean presentation. And the two parts are that there is a self-explanatory being. A self-explanatory being provides the explanation for why he exists. So part one is a self-explanatory being, and second, the second part is that God is a self-explanatory being. Here's the idea. The idea of a self-explanatory being, so what explains why something exists is either the cause of it or the reason for it. What explains why something is true or exists is either the cause of it or the reason for it. So why do you exist? Well, your parents. Um, why does the Empire State Building exist? Because um, of the source of steel and concrete and the workers who put it together. Why is it true that 5 plus 2 equals 7? Well, there's a reason for that. There's something in relation between the numbers that explain why that mathematical pattern holds. So the idea of there being a uh, self-explanatory being is there are dependent beings, that is, beings like you and me, that depend on something else. There are no unexplained beings. Things don't just pop into existence from nowhere. Right? Um, a Pop-Tart just doesn't come into existence from nowhere or leave from nowhere. Not everything can be a dependent being. We can't have an infinite sequence of beings that's claimed. Hence, there's a self-explanatory being. Okay. As a side note, I think this argument fails as well, but let's leave that aside for now. What I want to argue is the notion that God is a self-explanatory being, that that rests on the ontological argument. And if I can show you that that rests on the ontological argument, then I will have shown you that the, uh, that the cosmological argument has as its foundation the ontological argument. So if the ontological argument fails, so does the cosmological argument. Take the notion there's a feature of God that explains why he necessarily exists. And if there's a feature of God that explains why he exists, necessarily exists, then his perfection does the ex explanatory work. That is, why is it that God necessarily exists? Why doesn't the universe necessarily exist? Well, the idea is, well, because God's perfect, the universe is not. So perfection, then, has to explain why God is a self-explanatory being, or why he necessarily exists. But step two just is the ontological argument. It just tells us that perfection explains God, God's necessary existence. So that is step two just presupposes the ontological argument. For hence the cosmological argument depends on the ontological argument. So if the ontological argument fails, and I claim there's a number of reasons to think that it fails, then so does the cosmological argument. So that's my first argument. My first argument is a two-step argument. One, the cosmological argument and the ontological argument are the two best arguments for God's existence. But the cosmological argument depends on the ontological argument. So if the ontological argument fails, so does the cosmological argument, and there's no good argument for God's existence. The second argument I give is just an ar the problem of evil. You're all familiar with this. People have been, you know, usually you learn this somewhere in middle school. Um, well, I guess if you hang out with atheists, you learn this in middle school. So the idea is that there is a necessary evil in the world. That's the, the basic assumption. Premise two, if a perfect being exists, then there would be no unnecessary evil. What do I mean by unnecessary evil? I mean evil that does not have a morally sufficient reason. Right? Evil that didn't have to be there. It doesn't make the world a better place, and hence a perfect being does not exist. Now as a side note, I suspect that, that um, Dr. Tuggy and I very much agree on premise one. That we both think that there is unnecessary evil in the world. We probably disagree on premise two. And my assumption is that there either is unnecessary evil or we don't know whether there is unnecessary evil. And second, on the free will defense, which is a, a common move that theists make, um, they claim if there is unnecessary evil, then it is the byproduct of libertarian free will. Libertarian free will is kind of the radical free will that some people think we have, that we can zig or zag. Okay, just a few pictures, sorry for the ugly pictures, but I really want to get across the idea that there is unnecessary evil. On the top left, we see a hyena eating a wildebeest while it's still alive. I'm guessing that involves horrible suffering. I mean, a wildebeest neurological system is somewhat similar to ours. We'd suffer horribly if we were being slowly eaten while we were still alive and conscious. I suspect the wildebeest is as well. Why is that a good thing? Second, bottom left, uh, you can see the killing fields of Cambodia. Right? Two million people killed in some estimates. Um, an attempt to sort of recreate society in some Marxist image. Really, each one of those uh, deaths was, was made the world a better place? It's hard to believe that's true. And even if you thought that a lot of the deaths made the world a better place, which is, I think, a kind of a, an odd view, really there's no one particular individual who, for whom it wouldn't have been better had she not been slaughtered at point-blank range in the Cambodian killing fields? I doubt it. Top right, a rape in Sweden. I submit to you that this is paradigmatic. Uh, unnecessary evil, right? It's, it, it's hard to see why you think the fact that all three men rape her in fact makes the world a better place. The 
find that a um, sort of a very odd and, and disturbing view. Okay, two young children with cancer, right, well on the way to dying young. It's hard for me to believe that that somehow makes the world a better place. And of course, Adolf Hitler, and I don't need to go on about, about Adolf Hitler. Well, how would someone get, so let's, let's remind ourselves of what the problem of evil is. There is unnecessary evil in the world. If a perfect being existed, there would be no unnecessary evil. Hence, a perfect being does not exist. Is there a good objection to this? I claim that there is not. One standard objection is that evil is necessary for good, so there is no unnecessary evil in the world. This is just a conceptual error. You can imagine worlds that have good and no evil. Imagine a world with nothing but E.T. and Barney the Dinosaur hugging each other and exchanging pleasantries and, you know, and, and I mean, it's, it's kind of a nauseating world, but this is not a world with any evil in it. Hence, it's just false that evil is necessary for good. Well, you might think that evil is not necessary for good, but there is no unnecessary evil. That is, every instance of evil in the world, in fact, makes the world a better place, or at least does not worsen it. I find this just blatantly counterintuitive. It's hard for me to believe that each of those people who were killed in the Cambodian killing fields or the rape in Sweden, that each instance of that made the world a better place. On top of the fact, if you believe in libertarian free will, as most theists do, then it doesn't seem to be correct because people have free will so they can use it for good or bad purposes. Sometimes they use it for purposes that make the world a worse place. Well, you might object to premise two then. You might think, well, if a perfect being exists, there would be no unnecessary evil. I suggest to you that this is a mistake. Usually this rests on either um, the idea that there's free will in some radical sense or virtuous attitudes. I don't think this view of free will, radical free will, it's libertarian is the technical view, but I call it radical free, free will to defame it and the people who believe in it. That the idea is sort of radical free will, that we can sort of step out of our mental context. That, uh, that is, we can make choices independent of our beliefs and desires and how we reason. And once we step out of our mental states and mental events, that's what makes us responsible. I find that to be just a crazy worldview, right? What's left once you subtract your mental states, such as your beliefs and desires, and how you reason? What's left that makes you either free or that makes you responsible? Also, part two, free will can't explain things like natural evil. Even if you thought that free will explained evil, how do you explain the wildebeest and the, and the hyena? Is there some simpler mechanism whereby the, hyena, the wildebeest doesn't have to suffer when it's torn apart by a hyena? Um, it's hard to see how the free will defense solves that. Well, I have more to say here, but I want, I want to address just one last argument of, um, of Dale's, and that's the fine-tuning argument. Right. So this was Dale's other argument. He gave you basically three arguments. The cosmological argument, the fine-tuning argument, and the argument for religious experience. The fine-tuning argument and I like the version that Dale presented, sort of clean and interesting. Basically, it works something like the following, and this, this comes from a philosopher named Robert Collins. Suppose we went to Mars and found a dome structure in which everything was set um, just right for life to exist. The temperature was around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and the humidity was at 50%. Moreover, there was an oxygen recycling system, an energy gathering system, and a whole system for the production of food. Put simply, the dome structure appears to be a fully functioning biosphere. Well, I mean, clearly we would conclude that it was designed by some intelligent being because this is the only plausible explanation for the existence of the structure. So again, if we were traveling and we, we, we were traveling to Jupiter and we saw these two structures, clearly we would infer that they're an intelligent designer. What's the likelihood of these things having come together randomly or always been there? And the claim is that the universe is similarly structured. The argument is that if one explanation of a fact is better than others, then it is most likely true. Second, premise two, the intelligent designer explanation of the existence of intelligent life is better than others. Hence, the intelligent designer explanation of the existence of intelligent life is most likely true. That is, look, there's only, the claim is that, that the chance of the universe being structured to support intelligent life is off the charts small, you know, 1 over 10 to the 60th or something like that. And if you have such a miraculous result, and the odds of it, the antecedent odds, are sort of off the charts small, the most likely explanation is that you have an intelligent designer. Premise one is just a standard view of explanation. Premise two is where the action is. Right? And it rests on four assumptions. And I want to I attend to these four assumptions because I think um, this will show where the argument fails. The first assumption is that there is intelligent life. Second, is the intelligent life is the best result that could happen. 
and it's kind of a plausible view. You might think that what makes the world a better place is precisely the presence of intelligent life, or at least sentient life. Third, intelligent life is extremely unlikely. Here's where the action is. Pay close attention, please, to this one. The claim is that intelligent life requires biological life, and secondly, that biological life requires a narrow percentage of physical constants. Right? That is, you're not going to get intelligent life without biological life, and biological life requires this narrow range of physical constants. And then a premise four is kind of our, our assumption number four is kind of our background assumption. If the best result that could happen happens and is extremely unlikely to occur, then this is likely the result of an intelligent designer. So you can think of fine tuning as a radio dial. Unless all the dials are set exactly right, life would be impossible. I, I thought mine's a little more sophisticated, my dials, than Dale's radio, but, but yeah, you get the idea, right? Um, and the idea is that the world is kind of like a set of dials. You know, we wouldn't have a biosphere unless all the dials were set just right. And here's just a few examples. I'll just use the first two. The Big Bang explosion. If the initial explosion of the Big Bang had differed by strength as much as uh, one part in 10 to the 60th power, and for those of you who have done some math, you know 1 over 10 to the 60th is an incredibly small number, the universe would have either have quickly collapsed back on itself or expanded too rapidly for stars to form. In either case, life would be impossible. So very narrow dial setting. Secondly, the strong nuclear force. Calculations indicate that if the strong nuclear force, the force that binds protons and neutrons together in an atom, had been stronger or weaker by as little as 5%, life would be impossible. Now I claim that the fine-tuning argument fails and that it's nowhere near as good as the cosmological or ontological argument. In fact, it's a mistake for the theist to rest um, his or her argument on, the, on fine-tuning. It's just nowhere near as plausible as the other two. Here are the objections, every one of which I think is independently fatal. First of all, the notion that intelligent life requires biological life. I see no reason to think this is true. Do we know for sure that we're not going to have intelligent machines or that intelligent machines are impossible? I don't think so. Um, in fact, given that our consciousness is probably the result of neurons firing, electrochemical firing patterns, it's not obvious that you can't have non-biological life like conscious computers. But in any case, this is inconsistent with Christianity. If you're a Christian and you think God and angels exist, and you don't think they're biological entities, then you simply reject this premise. So this is not an assumption. 3A is just not an assumption that Christians, Christians and, and perhaps Jews can make. Second, biological life requires a narrow range of constants. That is, each one of these dials had to be set just so, so the probability is extremely small. I just don't think there's any reason to think that's true. How do we know that uh, moving one dial doesn't move the other? How do we know that those dials aren't all causally connected? In fact, we don't know that. So it might be that the likelihood is not all that small because if we change one dial, we change all the other dials, they're causally connected. We have to know that that was not the case. The, the other thing is even if you show that the universe has an intelligent designer, let's say you've shown that, then the claim is and that intelligent designer has to be God. That last step, again, is going to get the theists in trouble. Okay? Why? Ask yourselves a simple question. Um, who designed God? Well, if someone designed God, if God's a result of someone else, then he's not independent and he's not the greatest possible being, right? at least on the theistic account. On the other hand, if no one designed God, if he's self-explanatory, that is, he provides, um, he provides the explanation for his own existence, then we're back to the ontological argument. Or, desire, if desirable outcomes don't need a designer, like God, why couldn't the universe have come about without a designer? So there's a basic dilemma. Who designed God? And there's two possibilities. Either someone did, in which case God loses his independence or his necessary existence, or no one did, in which case we're back to the ontological argument. All right, so lightning quick summary of what I've argued. I've argued that the case for the theism lives and dies on the ontological argument and that the ontological argument fails. When the ontological argument fails, it pulls down the cosmological argument with it. And fine-tuning doesn't have a ghost of chance of working. Not only is it inconsistent with what we know about um, the possibility of consciousness and the Christian and Jewish doctrines, it has an odd view of the way in which these factors are independent, and in any case, it probably depends on the ontological argument. All right, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. That was interesting. I don't think that Dr. Kirshner, though, has effectively rebutted the case that I made. Notice that my case was that God is the best explanation for fine-tuning that we observe. He did not present another explanation and show that it's better. 
There is one explanation out there that philosophers have discussed. It's called the multiple universe hypothesis, and it's really out there. I'm going to maybe leave that for the Q&A time since he didn't present it. Now about his handout, his P1 at the, at the top of the first page, if God exists and the ontological or cosmological argument is sound. This is a bizarre statement. Lots of people believe in God and don't accept the ontological or cosmological arguments as sound. I'm not sure why anybody should agree with these. I wouldn't take a professional philosopher's word for it, even though he's a good philosopher. That's just not how you make decisions. You go with what's self-evident, what can be argued for. I don't see any argument for that. I didn't present a modal ontological argument, so I'm not going to say anything about that and defend it. I presented a fine-tuning argument, which many people think stands independent of any cosmological argument, but I did throw in a few cosmological argument type considerations. Yeah, about his uh, P2 on page 2, if a perfect being exists, there would be no unnecessary evil. I disagree with that. I'll explain why in just a second. Um, the back of his handout, his objections to the fine-tuning argument. Assumption 3A, that there's intelligent life only if there's biological life. The argument doesn't assume that. I don't think it's true because I believe in God and God is intelligent life. The argument just assumes that it's a very good thing that creatures like us exist and all the other inhabitants of the world. So I don't need assumption 3A. 3B I agree with. Biological life requires a narrow range of physical constants. He doesn't like the idea that uh, God's existence doesn't need to be explained in terms of anything else. But all he told you was that you have to have the ontological argument to reasonably say that. And I don't think he uh, said enough about that to persuade us that that's so. Again, we can maybe talk more about that in the Q&A. I think I should say a few things about evil before my short time is up. If you argue that because there's evil or too much evil or too many bad kinds of evil, so therefore God doesn't exist, what you're essentially saying is, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, maybe you wouldn't, but it's hard for little critters like us to imagine what a super powerful, super knowledgeable, super good creator would do. I don't go opinionating about how brain surgery should be done because I don't know jack squat about brain surgery. If I observed it, I might think that they're, about, that they're going about it all wrong. I might think they're killing the guy, but I'd have to remind myself that they know a lot more about brain surgery than I do. In short, God may have reasons for allowing various evils, even though we don't know what those are. I don't think we should assume that there are specific reasons for every evil that's allowed. I agree with Steve, there are gratuitous evils. And so I deny that if God exists, there can't be any gratuitous evils. If you unleash beings with a high degree of free will, you're not thereby intentionally bringing about whatever they freely do. You're merely allowing certain things. Steve doesn't believe in free will, so he doesn't think this makes sense, but I don't have time to defend belief in it right now. You might, though, ask, why would God allow so much freedom? Well, here are three very general sorts of considerations, of course, this won't explain why your mom got cancer or why your cat got crushed in the garage door opener and things like that, but there are very general sorts of reasons why evil would be allowed. First, there's the value of freely chosen love. It's plausible that our Creator would want people to love Him but is not willing to force that love. But then He must allow people to defy Him or even to hate Him. Imagine you could give your child a pill that would guarantee that she'll love you forever. Would you do it? I'll bet you wouldn't. I wouldn't do it. You'd rather take the risk of losing her. You'd rather hope that she will freely choose to be a good and loving daughter and not disown you. So you too place a really high value on freely chosen love. For a similar reason, you wouldn't, you, you know, you wouldn't want to use a love spell on somebody that you hope will fall in love with you. Second, if we're going to be able to control our environment, the laws of nature will have to be extremely regular. But then if you jump off a cliff, you will go splat. Our laws of nature and the way we're built imply that heads can get busted. But for all we know, these are the best set of natural laws that could be had. We have no idea what a better set would look like. Now you might say, why can't God just intervene constantly to prevent evil? It's a picture of Steve at home. <laughs> just, no, just, not really. He's, he's a much higher quality of atheist than this guy. You might say, well, why doesn't God just constantly intervene and prevent evil? So you go to kick your dog and your foot disappears for a second. You go to yell at your wife and all of a sudden you lose your voice. Well, one answer is this. This would take away your freedom to ignore God. 
He'd be like a dad that's attached to your hip. It goes everywhere you go. He's always up in your business. This would severely restrict your freedom. His interventions, if he makes any, have to be rare and ignorable so that you can continue your career as a big bad internet atheist. Finally, for all you know, the age of evil is finite. Theistic religions usually teach that at some future time, God will forever do away with evil, at least with moral evils. If time goes infinitely forward, this age of evil will be an infinitesimally small proportion of all of history. Right in my chart here, if that's the age of evil where that square is, that's the 14 billion years so far. Pretty soon the age of evil is over with. I mean, that makes it look like it's 100th, right? But it's not even a billionth of a billionth of all of history, according to theistic religions. If the rest of this history is pretty great, then from this perspective, it may easily have been worth it to allow evil to run amok for a comparatively short time. Now, I've not argued for Christianity in this debate, but my point now is, for all you know, this is how things will look from a broader perspective. And because of that, you can't infer too much from evil that's been going on for thousands, possibly millions of years. Okay, thank you. All right. As always, Dale's made excellent points. Certainly sort of requires sort of serious thoughts responding to someone as, as bright and, and powerful intellect as him. Nevertheless, I disagree with him. He said, look, uh, he hasn't committed himself to the ontological argument, and that's precisely where I disagree with him. I think he has. If you look at the cosmological argument, the cosmological argument has two parts to it. There's a self-explanatory being, that is, a being who explains his own existence. Again, I, I actually don't think this argument's a good one, but even if you thought there's a self-explanatory being, you still have to show that it's God. In virtue of what would God be the self-explanatory being? You can't just say, look, I'm just going to assume that if there's a self-explanatory being, it's God. Because someone might ask, well, why can't the universe be the self-explanatory thing? Why can't the universe explain its own existence? Now, if you were to say, well, the universe is not the sort of thing that could explain its existence, well, that's precisely the issue that applies with regard to God. And let me just give you an analogy. Um, look at the, the picture of the, the earth on the uh, elephants, which is on the tortoise. Imagine you said, okay, well, what does the earth rest on? And someone says, well, it rests on elephants. You say, what do the elephants rest on? And you say, a tortoise. You say, well, what does the tortoise rest on? And you say, well, I I'm just going to assume that the tortoise is a self-supporting being. Well, that wouldn't fool anybody. I mean, how can you just assume that the, that the tortoise is a self-supporting being? Similarly, you have to defend the notion that God is a self-explanatory being. You can't just assume it. Second, the fine-tuning argument. So the idea is, look, when I mean, we come upon these things, they're antecedent unlikely, and we think this has to have an intelligent designer. But it can't just be the complexity, because we know that natural forces can generate quite a bit of complexity. I mean, for example, uh, those are people who look at an electric eel or a cheetah, uh, you know you know those come about through evolution. They're incredibly complex, self-sustaining animals, um, and yet they don't have an intelligent designer. So it's got to be something more than complexity. It's got to be something like the following, right? That um, there's something really good that wouldn't have happened antecedently, right? And there we have the notion that it's intelligent life. Intelligent life is the best result that could happen. Intelligent life is extremely unlikely, and uh, if the, um, the best result that could happen happens, it's extremely unlikely to occur, then this is likely the result of an intelligent designer. Now, Dale responded, he said, look, um, I don't accept 3A. Um, okay, well, then in that case, it's a little hard to see um, why we should think that's true. Again, we do have very complex things like animals or designs that come about. There seems to have to be some sort of purpose to them before we assign an intelligent designer. And if you look at 3A, right, intelligent life requires biological life. Again, not only is this inconsistent with Christianity, but it just doesn't seem to be true. Um, Dale said he disagreed with the notion that the, the, the dials are causally linked, but we haven't seen any reason to think that they're not causally linked. I mean, how do we know at some fundamental level they're not causally linked? But in any case, the ontological argument still rears its ugly head, right? We still have to ask who designed God, either someone or no one, either, either um, part of the dilemma presents a problem for the theist. Now, just one last thing. Dale brought up religious experience. Shouldn't we um, uh, put some weight on the fact that people have experienced God? I would argue there are three reasons we should not. One, none of this stuff has been scientifically validated. And without scientific validation, we often don't put weight on people's experiences. People have experienced uh, UFOs, right? They've experienced contact with dead people. They've experienced leaving their body during surgery. Should we put credence on any of those beliefs? Um, I mean, they're widespread. 
Why put very much, if any, weight on those experiences? Third, people have often experienced an impersonal, godless universe. If we're taking into account experience, why doesn't that experience count? So in short, I think the ontological argument still is a linchpin for theism. Independently, I think that the problem of evil is fatal. But it's a linchpin, and I don't think it works. Okay, that's it. Thank you. My question is, why do we have to presuppose that God is an all-good being? Why can't we presuppose that he is evil and or amoral? So the fine-tuning argument doesn't depend on the claim that God is perfectly good. And my conclusion is that God is very good based on making such an amazing piece of art as the universe and including biological life. If you accept that there is a bodiless being that's independent of anything else, it's hard to see why a being like that would be driven towards any kind of temptation to do what's wrong. It wouldn't have needs, it wouldn't have hunger, get hungry, it wouldn't be having a bad day, it wouldn't be lonely and so on. And so um, it goes naturally along with the assumption. Theistic religions, of course, teach that God is perfectly good, that God can't do evil, God can't lie, and things like that. It seems there's good reason to believe that if you believe other things along with uh, the results of the argument. But the argument actually doesn't depend on God being perfectly good. Yeah, I mean, I think the ontological argument re requires that God be perfect and perhaps the greatest possible being. So I think there's, a, there's an argument, argumentation reason that the theist is sort of locked in on this. Um, I should also mention, and, and Dale's certainly the expert on this, but um, it's not clear that things like the Old Testament portray God as being a perfect being. So there's an issue as to the degree this lines up with theistic religions. But I would just say that the argument structure requires it. Similarly, the fine-tuning doesn't require that he be perfect, but it pushes in that direction. If he's creating this wonderful world, well, why would he be doing it? Well, he's wonderful. Well, how wonderful? but why would there be a limit? Thank you. This is a question for uh, Dr. Kirschman. Mm -hmm. um, in your uh, objection, there it says it can't be two omnipotent beings. Why is that? Because um, an omnipotent being means that you're able to do whatever is logically possible. But I mean, there's certain things that are logically possible that um, two omnipotent beings might conflict on, and they both can't win out. So just to use kind of a schlocky example, imagine that you know, God wants you know, Britney Spears to be the queen of Vegas, and the devil wants Christina Aguilera. Right, to be the, the queen of Vegas, and you can only have one queen of Vegas. Well, I mean, they both can't have their way, and the one who doesn't have their way would not be omnipotent. Okay. All right. Thank you. Most, but not all, theistic philosophers think there cannot be two omnipotent beings for reasons like that. Yeah. This is for Dr. Kirshner. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe in God, or I'm assuming an afterlife, what would you say the purpose of human life is? Good. Excellent. So, does human life lose its purpose with atheism? And I think no, right? The things that are valuable to us, which make our lives go better, better and the things that are morally valuable, are still present, right? We still want to have pleasure. We still want to have things like knowledge and meaningful relationships. We want to be in love with people. Um, we still want to have our desires fulfilled. And all of those things are both good for us and good, um, just morally good, independent of whether or not God exists. Which is one of the reasons that a lot of theists do not think that morality depends on God. They think that morality is independent of God precisely because these things are, at least intuitively, independently valuable. Yeah, if, if there's no God, life is not going to have a meaning that doesn't depend on us and our preferences. Or it's not going to have the kind of meaning that depends on an afterlife either. Um, some atheists still believe that life can have value because they believe in moral values. Um, then, on the other hand, some atheists just don't believe in moral values. They think those are just fictional. Um, they think evolutionary theory undercuts belief in any kind of objective moral values. I, I, I would note here that, in line with this, it's, it's, um, it's not clear that the theist wouldn't think in the same way about morality and meaningful, meaningfulness in life as the atheist. A, a theist might say, look, I mean, you know, rape and murder are just always wrong regardless of whether or not God exists. It's not arbitrary that God commands people not to engage in these things. He has a reason to command that people not do these things, and that's because these things are independently you know, uh, wrong and, and, in fact, evil. Same thing with, you know, pleasure makes someone's life go better. That's true regardless of whether God exists. So that's why God wants his, crea uh, his people he's created to be happy because he wants their lives to go well. And again, that seems to be the pleasure, that pleasure makes your life go better, seems to be independent of whether or not you think the theism is true or not. 
Just throwing one extra point, Steve, Steve mentioned people uh, in his rebuttal that uh, seem to experience a godless universe or a purposeless universe. Look, I don't have perfect pitch. That's a mystery to me why anybody does. I don't know how they do it. In fact, if I, when I first found out about it, I don't think I believed in it. Uh, but then some people just do. We don't know why, but they in fact do. Maybe there are some people that just are able to perceive uh, God's purposes in the universe. And why? Well, we don't know. Uh, but the fact that I, if I haven't, maybe there's some reason for that. Maybe I never tried. Maybe I didn't want to. Or maybe something's wrong with me. I don't know why I don't have perfect pitch, I, but uh, that doesn't stop me believing the people who do. If they say that's a C-flat or a C-sharp, there's no C-flat. <laughs> that's a B. <laughs> it's been a long time since those piano lessons. Well, let me, let me suggest this too. Look, I mean, when people report that they spoke to, to a dead individual, and, and, and I, I bet a good deal of you have had friends or people you've come in contact with who explain they've had a really meaningful experience when they've spoken to a, a deceased grandparent or a deceased parent, and that changed their lives. I take it we don't take that as strong evidence, perhaps not any evidence, that you know, their, their mother really is, their deceased mother really is, in some sense, inhabiting the world around them, or their uncle is. Um, we don't think this about um, uh, people who experience being taken by UFOs. We don't think this about people who have experienced leaving their body during surgery. If we don't give credence to these sorts of experiences, I'm not sure why would we give credence to uh, religious experiences. In every case, it's inference to the best explanation, right? I mean, maybe this person just saw a movie about alien abductions on TV. Maybe they're a little crazy. Um, but look, it, the inference to the best explanation could point you into the direction that it really happened. It just depends what it is. If there, there are a few cases of near-death experiences where people say they were outside their bodies, where they do appear to have information that they only could have had when they had no brain activity and no heart activity. Okay, well, you could see why that would confirm that they really were out of their body, if that's right. So it just, it depends. Um, there, there can be lots of explanations that don't involve the experience being accurate. And that holds for religious ones too, right? If I just took a bunch of LSD and stayed up for four days straight and drank 20 beers, and now I say I experienced God, well, you know, we're gonna think maybe your brain's malfunctioning. <laughs> Although you would have had a good time on the way. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so Dale and I agree about in the inference of the US explanation. I think he's right. Um, we do have to look at the particular instances and particular beliefs. I, I claim that, look, just in general, we are very low to admit, in, to admit empirical evidence when it doesn't meet the basic canons of scientific verification. And I would suggest to you that this is such a case. So this is, I don't know if this is an issue of free will, but this is a question about how would you explain why some people who have believed in God their entire life suddenly feel forced to not believe in him due to events like the Holocaust, for example, if that makes sense. Why would God allow that event to happen if they feel that they're being forced to lose their belief? Yeah, that's a particularly tough case of the problem of evil. Um, why, why God allows people to lose belief in God. I mean, the first thing I would say is that beliefs I don't think are voluntary. I don't think anybody just chooses what to believe. And uh, you just find yourself having certain beliefs. And it depends on what evidence you've seen and kind of how things strike you. It's not very hard to imagine somebody who's been through the Holocaust uh, having an experience where it just seems like there's no purpose or the the beliefs that they had as a, you know, a child growing up in the Jewish part of uh, Poland, why they would find that not plausible. Um, look, people who believe in God get pretty mad at God sometimes. They obviously don't know why these things have been allowed to happen, and they're protesting because they don't think they should have been allowed to happen. So I don't, I don't know what to say as far as a general answer. Um, a person like that could very well shift back into believing in God when they thought about it a little bit more because maybe they overlooked something or um, maybe there's some kind of non-rational factor involved. There, there, there are always those things to worry about. Thanks, that's a good tough question. Appreciate it. Hey, so my question is, mm -hmm. um, like in a world, like say like um, that there isn't God, why would like that world have to be like not have any purpose? Like, let's say that um, in order for anything to have a purpose in existence, there needs to be something that is experiencing 
that existence to give that existence any kind of purpose, right? So why is it that it would have to be like on the theistic side? Why would it have to be God? Like why can't like reality um, be governed by say like some kind of a pool of consciousness? Like all that is experiencing is itself, which is reality itself. Why can't that just be you know each a droplet in a pool of consciousness or an ocean of consciousness? This is a question for me, right? Um, I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand the last part of it. What, this is an alternative hypothesis to believing in God. Yeah, that's another potential. The pool of consciousness. Is there any? But there's no, there's no thing that's conscious. It's just consciousness running wild well, by itself. That, um, um, why does like God have to be the very thing that gives anything purpose? Oh, okay, yeah. You know? So you could you could distinguish between um, subjective value and objective value. Subjective value is just that somebody likes something, right. and so if there were no intelligent beings at all and no God too, then there would be no subjective value in the universe, right? Because nobody would be liking anything. Now myself, I believe in objective value. If a planet full of intricate, let's say plant life, got destroyed, the universe would be, so to speak, poorer off because of that. And so I think there are uh, objective values and um, there's no simple formula to like telling how valuable a thing is. I mean, I think a person is worth more than an electron. I think a mouse is worth more than a pebble. It's not a matter of size, uh, but it's a matter of um, the, the intrinsic value would seem to, philosophers say, supervene on its other qualities. Uh, if it has intelligence, if it has consciousness, if it has experience. I do think that uh, there would be objective value to living things and other things even if God didn't exist. But uh, what there wouldn't be is the kind of meaning that requires that you're you know, going along with God's purposes, engaging in something bigger than yourself, so that type of thing. There wouldn't be that type of meaning. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I see what you mean. And on this one, actually, Dale and I agree. Um, I, I do think objective, uh, objective value is independent of what God wants or values, and otherwise it would be arbitrary, right? Why would he say that, look, you should fall in love, you should know things, you should be virtuous. Um, you should experience pleasure. Presumably there's some reason that he tells us that we should pursue these things. If it didn't, it would be arbitrary. He, j he would, could just as well have said you should pursue misery, or you should pursue cruelty, or abandonment. Even the notion that God is all good, right? If by goodness we just mean whatever God prefers, or if it just re refers to whatever it is that God likes or values, then God is all good would just mean that God is preferred or valued by God. I mean, that's not getting across what the theist himself thinks, which is that God is all good in some sort of independent notion of goodness. As a side note, if in fact there is no objective morality, um, yet again the ontological argument fails because we lose uh, what it would mean to be the greatest possible being. Um, my question is, why does free will, maybe I missed this, uh, negate um, uh, the existence of evil, or it's not a valid argument for why it exists? So, so Dale and I have different views about free will. A side note, Dale's done, um, is published on this, and his dissertation on this, he is an expert on free will. But that said, I think this version of free will is mistaken, right? This is the idea that you really can sort of step outside your mental states and how you reason, and then decide how to behave. So up until the po time you make a decision, the idea is that even holding every one of your mental states fixed, what you believe, what you desire, and how you reason, it's still open for you to do one thing um, as opposed to the other. And the luck objection, which is what I'm using here, just says, look, that's arbitrary. Once we screen out your mental states and how you reason, there's nothing left that's attributable to you. And if there's nothing left that's attributable to you, it can't be what makes you free, nor can it be what makes you responsible. So the idea is that the sort of um, radical free will, libertarian free will is, is, is the technical term, um, that the theist needs to account for evil is just not a very plausible view of what makes people either free or responsible. Yeah, so if you believe in what's called libertarian free will, it has nothing to do with a political party by that name. It's just, it means that you're able to choose freely, and before you chose freely, you could have uh, withheld or made a different choice. So it's a kind of freedom that implies having actual alternatives. And the thing is, by definition, you can't give beings freedom like that and then control everything they ever do with it. Because you'd be giving them that kind of freedom and not giving it to them. If you give beings that kind of freedom and you want them to be able to choose to become good or bad people, some bad, some bad stuff's going to go down. And it's not stuff that you wanted to happen, it's stuff that you foresaw could happen. But that's the idea, that God is willing to make that trade-off. 
He doesn't think that works because he thinks this uh, concept of free will is just incoherent. Well, this is the kind of free will that arguably most people believe in. I don't, I don't think it's been shown incoherent. Dale is absolutely right about that, that most people do have this view of free will. Let me just give you a quick example why you might think it's incoherent. It's called the rollback argument from Peter Van Inmog and Dale and I are both very familiar with it. So here's the case. You have a woman and she's, getting, she's on her way for her re rehearsal ceremony. She's getting married. And there's a, a child who's injured in, in some sort of bike accident, bicycle accident, on the side of the road. So she stops to help the child. Um, but if, you, if God were to roll the events back a thousand times, 500 times, she helps the child out. 500 times she goes to the rehearsal ceremony. And you say, okay, um, so it's a 50% chance likelihood and she does you know, equal numbers of, of things. What would explain why she helps the child in the actual world as opposed to the 50% of the time where she does not? Well, it can't be some feature about her because up until the time she makes that decision, her mental states are fixed. That's what allows her to zig or zag. How she reasons is fixed. That's what, that's what makes it open for her to go both ways. But if you say, well, well what is attributable to her that explains why she helps the child whether, as opposed to not doing so, there's just no explanation. And certainly no explanation that can explain why people are responsible or why they're free. But isn't the existence of free will that option being available? Right, but the, the, the view of free will that the theist has, and, and presumably this is what Dale has, is that free will is valuable because it makes human beings morally responsible. So if this version of free will does not explain why people are responsible, it's not going to do the work necessary to explain why we have these oceans of evil in the world. Hi, my question is for Dr. Kirchner. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of touched on it a little bit, but my question is, if there is no God, how would you explain morality? Because um, for Christians, the standard of morals comes from God. So without a God, how are there morals? Good. So does morality depend on God? And here I suspect that Dale and I actually agree. I mean, I like the question, by the way. And I think that even a theist should say, even the, the most religious um, Jew or Christian should say that morality is independent of God's existence. And the reason why is because we don't want God's commands or preferences to be arbitrary. Right? So God commands, you know, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. But it, it's really it's not arbitrary that he says these things. He says these things because they're in fact wrong. That is the explanatory order goes from the wrongness of these things to why he commands us not to do them. If the explanation went the other way, right, they're wrong because God commands us not to do them, they'd be arbitrary. He could just as well as have said, um, it's obligatory that you murder or steal or commit adultery. And that's kind of an odd view of God's relation to morality. Same thing with God being all good. If God's all good and goodness just means what God prefers, or just refers to what, what, God, what God prefers, then we, when we say God is all good, all we're saying there is God is all preferred by God. And that, and that seems to be hard to follow. I agree that some actions are intrinsically right or intrinsically wrong, and the intrinsically wrong ones are such that God couldn't command them because he's good. But Steve, let, let's, be, let's put our cards on the table here. I mean, don't you think that if naturalism is true, that evolutionary developments undermine our belief in objective moral values? So there's an independent question whether I believe in moral realism. And so Dale and I are friends, we have lots of discussions. And he knows I'm, uh, these days I'm a little skeptical of moral realism, the idea that there is an objective morality. And I think he's right. I, and I do suspect that we probably want to infer this from the way in which sort of other non-humans behave in a sort of quasi-moralistic fashion. Um, so I think that's true. But even if one rejected that, so even if one thought there is moral realism, still I would think that you'd want it to be independent of God. Um. In the religious belief, um, God created everything, and we were made in the image of God to be eventually like him. All of two of the things that you had stated as far as the skyscraper being built out of the steel and the workers that built it, and also intelligent machines. Intelligent machinery, in order to be creative and intelligent, was created by a human or whoever created it to be creative and intelligent. Um, the same with the building. In order for the building to be constructed, it needs a base plan in order to be constructed. H how would you explain the ability for humans to have ideas um, and the desires for pleasure if we were not initially created and programmed to have that ability? 
Well, I mean, I would think that evolution provides a nice explanation, right? Pleasure performs a useful function which allows us to survive and reproduce, which is um, one of the reasons our pleasure seems to sort of, you know, be pushed back to some equilibrium level. You can get high, but it gets dropped down or low, it gets pushed back up. So there's probably an evolutionary purpose to it. Same reason why do we have such strong sexual desires? Well, again, it probably has an evolutionary explanation. So my claim is that these, these uh, mental, th these psychologies, um, the sort of common psychology that almost all of us share, is probably due to evolution. How would you explain ideas? Ideas. Well, I mean, so I think that some higher level consciousness, again, is probably another evolutionary advantage, right? If you have things like coordination or socially linked networks, you might think it's a much more effective um, way to survive if you're an ape. For example, if you can coordinate tightly and not spend time fighting amongst yourselves or plan things out. So in terms of evolution, I think evolution provides us a nice explanation as to why, in fact, we have ideas and these higher level concepts because of its advantages towards survival and reproduction. I suspect Dale doesn't, Dale probably agrees with me on this. Well, you said a bunch of things there. I'm not sure if I agree with all of them, but since he, since he uh, brought up intelligent machines, uh, I wanted to throw in this point that, right, so biological life as we know it seems to require quite a lot. It requires a lot of carbon and all kinds of things. And so sometimes people say, well, what if there's non-carbon based life forms? Uh, what if they're intelligent machines? But yeah, but these uh, physicists and cosmologists, when they're discussing what the cosmos would be like if you tweak some of these things by one billionth of whatever, sometimes you just don't even get stars and planets and you, don't, and you have like one or two kinds of atoms in the universe and uh, you just don't even have enough complexity even to have intelligent machines. So, I mean, this is, this is really out there, uh, hard to imagine stuff. Some of these scenarios are so chaotic so as not to allow any kind of organized complexity, it would seem. Right, but I'm not sure that you need physical beings to have consciousness if you have um, God. I mean, if, if God can exist independent of some sort of physical embodiment, it's not clear why he can't create intelligent creatures that are independent of physical embodiment. I, I don't know enough about angels. I, I know apparently there are nine types, but th that, that's what I know about angels. Um, I don't know if they're physical or not, but if they're not, it's not clear you need physical complexity to get angels. Angels are a red herring. I mean, we're, we're trying to discuss the fine-tuning that's observed in the universe. There needs to be a cause other than the universe, outside of the universe for that. And if angels are non-physical beings, well, that's just another subject. But, but it's not just the complexity that, that moves the fine-tuning argument. It's complexity towards a purpose or towards a good result. Again, a cheetah is an incredibly sophisticated machine, but we don't think that it had a designer because we have an explanation for this. We need something like an incredibly small likelihood of something happening and that result being either really good or having a purpose and that's what signals that the fine-tuning argument is in operation and, and, and that's what I claim is just not um, is, is not something we're, we're entitled to do. Could you guys be able to touch on the multiverse argument really quick? You mentioned it uh, during your rebuttal, I think. Yeah, so this is another explanation of fine-tuning that some people take seriously. They're agreeing that the universe appears to be finely tuned and they're saying here's, a, here's an alternate explanation that doesn't involve God. There's some kind of universe generating process and it spits out an infinite number of cosmoi, of entire space times. And when it spits them out, it randomizes the laws of nature, the constants, and the initial conditions. And if you have an infinity of cosmoi that have been put out in this way, well, I guess sometimes the dials are gonna come out right. And so it's probable that there be some finely tuned universes. So this does explain fine tuning, but it has some really bizarre problems. You just posited an infinity of cosmoi, which are in principle unobservable because they don't have any spatial or temporal connection to our universe. That's really going out there, as opposed to positing one being. Also, what is, what is this imaginary cosmos generating process that randomizes the variables? I mean, it sounds like it would be some kind of amazing ma uh, machine, so to speak, that would have to be finely tuned itself. And if so, then it just kicks up the explanation that's needed to another level. You'd still have to appeal to God. Uh, even to have that. I mean, the worst thing is it's, it's infinitely less simple than theism. And if anyone takes it seriously, my question is, are you willing to believe anything to avoid believing in God? Because this, this explanation looks really bad. It's the opposite of a parsimonious explanation. I, I think maybe Steve thinks it's bad, I'm not sure. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm skeptical of, of it for the same reason that Dale is. I, I don't know enough about the physics of it to, to know the degree to which it's, it's plausible or not. But I think Dale makes a good point. I mean, we, we want the simplest and most powerful explanation. Um, it's not clear the multiverse is, in fact, simpler or more powerful than uh, the theistic account. Because the only thing it has going in its favor is people feel like it's just positing more of the same. Okay, so you're okay with physical reality. And let's just posit infinitely more than we could ever potentially observe. But uh, look, um, we, we do all the time employ explanations that appeal to intelligent agents. And we seem to think those are perfectly good. And if we have to be talking about something beyond the cosmos, I don't see what's so terrible about supposing a non-physical being as an explanation. Uh, so again, I think simplicity is a big, a big deal there. Um, and whereas some people claim they've experienced God, absolutely nobody claims that they've experienced any other cosmos. But they couldn't. They couldn't get any physical information from another cosmos. Thanks. Thanks for asking about that. I wanted to use that last slide. <laughs> uh, you guys mentioned a lot about probabilities, both of you. And uh, quantum mechanics, everything's probabilistic, so everything is probabilistic. But when you bring it to infinity, things start to fall into place. So my question is, if, say, the human race just lives to infinity, we just never cease to exist, and all the way through time we continue to exist. We discover things all the time, so if we were to, over an infinite amount of time, explain everything possible, is there even a point to a God, or does that kind of usurp the position that God could exist if we can explain everything over infinity? So you're imagining that, you know, a thousand years from now we can explain why every one of these factors is exactly the way it is? I guess that would undermine the fine-tuning argument then. Uh, there are other arguments for God's existence, and uh, it wouldn't touch the point about religious experience. But, I mean, these are rock-bottom constants, <laughs> and why do we think they're contingent and could be different? It's because we just can't see any necessity to their being that way. Why do we think they're independent? They just seem to be independent. Uh, yeah, it could come out, it could turn out that we discover some further facts. We have some major scientific revolutions and we find that some of them are connected. Uh, but look, take a couple of those dials and tie them together. You still get really outrageous probabilities that things are finely tuned, even if you tie a couple of them together. And by the way, 10 is a simplification. There are more than two dozen of these factors that are cited in the literature. Uh, and <laughs> also, for all we know, uh, in, in 100 or 500 years, science will just pile on more apparent fine tuning. That's kind of the trend that's been happening in the last 50 years. They just keep coming up with more examples. The more cosmologists think about this stuff, the more weirdly, precisely balanced factors they keep finding. I'm just not sure what the evidence is that the dials are, in fact, not, not causally linked in some way. Um, there's a lot of things in science that we discovered later on are causally linked that didn't at the time seem that they were causally linked. But uh, leaving that aside, I mean, I tend to think, look, the, the question is, does the intelligent designer, um, does that um, depend on the ontological argument? And you can say, well, it, it doesn't, but, but then you think, well, same sort of issue applies. I mean, who intelligently designed God? And again, either you have someone or no one, and it seems that either path is going to he head you down um, into problematic areas. So even if Dale were right, even if these dials are independent, and the probabilities are off the charts small, I'm not sure that the intelligent designer um, explanation and put in terms of God solves it because we still want to know, okay, well then why is God the intelligent designer? Note also that the God hypothesis assumes not just that he's an intelligent designer, but that he has all these other properties, right? That he has things like he's all powerful, he's all good, he's all knowing, or at least some compatible set of those, even if he's not doesn't have an infinite amount of those three. Um, so we want to know, is there some explanation that explains both why he's the intelligent designer and why he has all these good features? We, we we need some sort of um, explanation of that, and that's where I think we run into trouble. And that's where the ontological argument becomes central. One little point. Steve, Steve doesn't like this idea that the buck should stop with God. He's, he wants to say it's cheating somehow, but I don't think he's very clear about how. He seems to think that you have to have a sound ontological argument, which again, I don't want to get into uh, to believe in this. Right? But what you have to have is a being that exists prior and independently of the cosmos. So they would exist whether or not there was a cosmos. And the suggestion is that there is an ultimate source of all else. So he can't have a source. It can't be caused. If you say who designed God, I think that entails that God was caused, right? 
Again, you're asking what's north of the North Pole. You're just not getting that this is supposed to be an unoriginated source of all else. What explains his necessary existence? I think it's just explained by the fact that he, uh, if it's a fact, it's explained by the fact that he exists and is independent of anything else. So I actually think when, when someone says God's independent, they're just saying he's a self-explanatory being. I think they're just repeating that term in a different guise. They haven't said something new. And in terms of why, why I think it relies on the ontological argument, I mean, here's the idea. I look, imagine I said the cosmos are the self-explanatory being. That is, um, you know, they are the thing that explains everything that, that follows from it. It doesn't have to be the planets. It could be the matter. It could be the time. It could be the space or some combination of those. And you might say, well, the cosmos those themselves don't look like this self-explanatory entity. That is the thing that explains everything else. And I say, okay, maybe not, but in virtue of what? Is God the uh, a plausible self-explanatory entity and the cosmos not? There has to be a further explanation. And the further explanation is what's got to cause a need for, for us to focus on something like perfection or greatest possible being or something along those lines. Um, and again, imagine by analogy, imagine the, the earth rests on these elephants and the elephants rest on the tortoise. And I say, yeah, but what does the tortoise rest on? And you say, look, this tortoise is just a self-supporting being. Well, well, I mean, surely there's something more that has to be said here. If someone said God is independent or self-explanatory, assuming those mean the same thing, then uh, again, I would say the same thing. Surely there's something more that has to be said here. Well, look, you want to know the difference between God and the cosmos is, Steve? Uh, look, the cosmos is the sum total of physical things. Now, all the physical things that we know about depend for their existence on certain conditions for their existence. And they can come into existence and go out of existence. They're physical things. Now, things get pretty weird and hard to imagine when you try to describe the Big Bang process at the beginning of it. But look, still, for any physical thing, we can suppose that it doesn't happen. And that's just how physical things are. And God's not supposed to be a physical thing. He doesn't seem to demand a cause. I mean, even that's true for any individual physical thing. It's not clear it's true for all physical things. And I claim, look, in virtue of what do we think that God is independent of things in a way in which physical objects are not? We need an explanation here. Oh. Um, I mainly have a question for you. You seem to really reject the idea of free will. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you would argue for determinism? Because then you could go back a billion years and everything, like everything that was taking place a billion years ago would determine everything that's happening right now. And then how would you have all those choices? Like you said, the lady that goes and helps like the child that falls off of her bike, how would she make those decisions if it was already determined? So I'm not sure if I think determinism is true because I don't know enough about quantum indeterminacy at a fundamental level. But the point is, would the presence or absence of determinism change the degree to which responsible? And I claim the answer there is no. So whether things are determined or whether there's quantum indeterminacy, that's going to have no effect on whether or not we're responsible for what we do. Because, um, again, the idea is that our actions are still flowing through our mental states and decisions. Maybe that's responsibility grounding, maybe it isn't. But nothing about so that, you know, radical options changes that. Well, thank you all very much for coming, especially you for staying.